Good morning, church. Good morning, family. Yes. As we gather together today, um, my heart is a bit heavy, not just because my wife is down with COVID. When we just found out about it uh, this morning, I tested and I was negative, which is why I'm here, but I'm putting on my mask. And please forgive me if I'm not uh, in my usual self, you know, welcoming you and all that, because I just want to be careful so that I don't spread anything to you. But our hearts are also heavy because of our recent loss of a cherished uh, founding member of our church. Um, some of you may know uh, Mr. Yap Kok Kyung, uh, Ben Yap's uh, father, and also Deborah's grandfather. And to Ben, um, ben yes, to Ben and your family, especially to Mildred as well, I send my condolences and on behalf of the church, we mourn together with you for your loss, yeah, of your beloved father. And I pray that the promises of our Lord uh, through his word will comfort you because he's now in a better place. But in the midst of all these somber notes of, of the funeral, I witnessed a very touching moment. As Mr. Yap's casket was moving towards his final destination, I heard a very faint yet very powerful cry escape from a very frail, white-haired lady in front of me. She's none other than Mrs. Yap, Ben's mum. And with her tear-filled eyes and heart full of love, she whispered this very word, Darling, see you in heaven. In that cold, dark, it was dusk, it was in the evening, in the cold, dark, silent viewing hall, her words resonated deeply within me because I, I sensed a profound, deep love and bond that she had with her husband. And as I drove that long, winding road, you know, from Mandai Crematorium, many of us may have driven that road before, a question popped up in my mind, and I asked myself this question. What gave Mrs. Yap the confidence, the assurance that her husband is now with the Lord in heaven? What gave her the assurance that she will have a reunion with, her, with him again? And more importantly, how can we likewise find that assurance, that confidence amidst loss, amidst life's deep struggles? <coughs> Last week, we embarked our series, a new series through the Ephesians entitled Reconcile to Reach. We anchored ourselves in the truth that if Jesus is all we got, He is all we need. In fact, um, we hear that refrain in Throughout this whole week, I was visiting several of you. You remember this and you repeated that to me, which is a good thing, all right? If Jesus is all we've got, He's all we need. We know that in Christ, our identity, our unity, and our security is found. That is God's master plan. Jesus is all we need and all we've got. And today, we want to dive deeper into that in Christ relationship with Jesus, exploring how we can have that confidence in the face of challenges that 2024 will bring to us, in the face of challenges that you perhaps are going through right now. And I do not know what kind of struggles or grief you are facing at this moment, perhaps an uncertain future, a strained marriage, even an illness an unresolved misunderstanding. But whatever the struggles and troubles you are having right now, I pray that we may experience the same resilient confidence that transcends the darkness of sin and leads us towards a joyful thanksgiving to God for His salvation plan in Christ Jesus. And in the words of the Apostle Paul in the passage that was just read to us in verse 18, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And the question I want to ask all of us to think about, to meditate on is, how can we find confidence amid life's struggles? 
How can you and I face tomorrow with the hope, the assurance, like what Mrs. Yap had for her husband as well? And this is where we want to examine the pattern of Paul's prayer. In fact, verses 15 to 23 is really an extended prayer of Paul after he has presented Christ, the power of Christ, uh, in the first 14 verses. We can see and find the answer not only just in the pattern of his prayer, but also on the person of the prayer, the object of his prayer as well. And this is what he said in verses 18 to 19. And he says, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? I want us to examine that structure of Paul's prayer. In fact, I've already uh, I highlighted that to you in that passage that you see on the screen right now. I want us to examine those three focuses of Paul's prayer, the calling, the inheritance, and the power. And I want us to consider how these three focuses can be manifested in our lives today. And how are these things, these three things, uh, helping us to find that confidence amid life's struggle today? Paul has, in fact, already heard how the Ephesians are fulfilling the commandment to love God and their neighbours. In fact, verse 15, he, he said this, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ of the Lord Jesus and your love towards the same. Now, isn't that wonderful that he who has spent three years with, with them, um, we read that in Acts 19, that he realizes that they are already growing in the faith. They have loved the Lord. We have some AV problem, but you know what? Let's just continue on with this. This means what? That in our struggle, in your struggle right now, and I again do not know what your struggles are, when we cannot see what lies ahead, we can still have hope. We can still have hope because God stays true to His plan. Remember, He never changes His plans. God can be trusted. That calling is the first focus of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And it is my prayer as well that you will have hope in your calling that God has already called you to. That's the first thing that Paul prays for. But the second thing that he prays for is the inheritance. But this is interesting because he calls us to trust that we belong to God's inheritance. It says here, let me read it for you. It says here, In Him, sorry, sorry, what is, verse 18, what is, what, or what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? The second focus of Paul's letter dwells on God's inheritance, not our inheritance. You see, when, usually when we read this verse, and when I first read this, read this verse, uh, earlier this week, I, I thought, oh, Paul is repeating what he said earlier in verse 11, right? In him we have obtained inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Fine, okay, so Jesus is our inheritance, wonderful. But notice here that this is not what Paul says. Paul is saying that you and I, are God's inheritance. Think about that for a while. We are easily mistaken that Paul is focusing on the wealth, the blessing, and the benefits that God bestows upon us, as found in verse 11. But actually, in verse 18, he is not saying that. He's saying that you and I belong to God and God delights in that. What does that mean? 
That means that you and I are precious. You and I are precious that we belong to Him. He calls us His precious, His beloved. When was the last time that you say to yourself, I am precious in God's sight? Why don't you say that to yourself right now? I am precious in God's sight. Now turn to your neighbour, even though you may not agree, turn to your neighbour, you are precious in God's sight. Some of you are laughing away, especially spouses. Huh? The thing is, as I, ex- as I explored this, I realised that throughout this whole letter, that is also one of major themes that, that Paul is trying to impress upon the Ephesians. This is not new. In fact, God has already said so way back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. Moses was singing a song. Remember, they were not in the promised land. They were about to enter into the promised land. And this is what he sang. I do not know the tune, but let me read for you those verses in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. He says, When the Most High, that is God, gave to the nations their inheritance... When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Verse 9. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted inheritance or heritage. So the people of Israel is God's inheritance. But then how can trusting that we belong to God's inheritance help us, especially in our struggles? And the amazing thing is this. Paul is saying this to the Ephesians and to himself as well. And as the letter is being circulated around that area to the early church, you must understand that Paul is cognizant and I hope we are cognizant of the fact that we are all sinners in need of grace. So despite our spiritual poverty, I wonder how can God find any inheritance, any value, any worth in you and I? And also in the Ephesians. And yet God made riches out of the poverty of our lives because why? He invests so much in us. He invests all that He had in us. Many of us invest in various things. I think the biggest investment we ever made, at least to me, is a house. (laughs) Our our place is the biggest investment. Our our accommodation is the biggest investment we have ever made. Maybe some of you have better and more investment. You don't have to tell me this. But notice that when we invest a lot on other things, God is saying that I invest in you. And here I would like to talk to the parents as well and to your leaders amongst us that many of us are investing in the wrong things in life. Later on in chapter 4, four 5 and 6, he talks about that investment into relationships. And I think it is important for us to get this right, that we should invest into our children's lives, not in that share or that investment portfolio that you so wanted, because that is a means to an end. The end itself is that relationship you want with your family, with your church, with your group of people. And this is where I would like to share with you that God has ultimately invested in us everything. How do I know that? Because through Jesus Christ and in Christ Jesus himself, he allowed Jesus to come to this earth to die for you and my sin. This is all in his showing hand in gambling terms. He's telling us that this is all that He had and all that we need. That's how much God loves us. And if you think about it, 
If you know that God loves you so much that He's willing to let His Son die for you and I, for yourself especially, how does that make you feel? I do not know of any other ways and means of love that is of that magnitude and that sacrificial love that can comfort you in your moments of doubt, in your moments of despair, in your moments of discouragement. In those moments, we need to trust that we belong to God's inheritance because He has totally invested in us through Son Jesus Christ. So then, to find confidence in the midst of life struggle, we hope in God's calling and we trust that we belong to God and God's inheritance. But there's another focus of Paul's prayer in these two verses. And that focus is the third point that I'm trying to share with you, and that is faith in God's power. Verse 19 says, And what is, see the refrain again, what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might? In verse 19, Paul desires for believers to comprehend the great power of God. This, this divine power is a motive that Paul develops throughout the letter again later on. And is available only to who? As what the verse says, for all who believe. So what can this power do in our struggles, you may be asking. See, the rest of the chapters, he develops that. I just want to surface two things, two important things that this power can do for us. The first is this power strengthens us in our inner being or in another translation, our inner man. Ephesians 3.16 says that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. The inner being. Later on, in the subsequent um, sermons, you will hear how that can be expounded later on, um, but essentially it's about your mind, your emotions, and the spirit within you. That, that's what it means by the inner being. It rep represents you and I, our deepest, most authentic self. And that identity is being strengthened even as we depend on that power that Paul is praying for the Ephesians. And that power, in fact, gives us renewed minds. Chapter 4, verse 23 tells us that power is available for us to renew our mind. And it helps us to be resilient in our emotions. It nourishes our soul. But that's a one thing that this power can do for us. But the second thing the power can do for us is to protect us during spiritual warfare. In chapter 6, he talks about this spiritual warfare, but essentially he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. We face difficulties in life, but do not forget we also face the darkness of the world there will be evil forces that are fighting to draw us away from God. And therefore, that power is available for you and I when we are in Christ Jesus, especially during our struggles. But that begs the question, what, what is this power, right? I know the, the benefits of this power, but what is this power? And this is where the central thesis, the, the, the submit of his prayer comes about in verses 20 to 23. And let me read for you the, the whole thing itself. What is this power? That, verse 20, that he worked in Christ, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. 
verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who feels all in all. The entire prayer of Paul found in verses 15 to 19 centers solely on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That available power in Ephesians is not merely just a theoretical concept. It, it, it is more of a dynamic force that actively is at work through the resurrection and the exaltation of Christ. We can only have that power if Christ is raised from the dead. We can only have the power and we have that power because He is not exalted above all things. All things. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. That's what the, those verses remind us. He is our King and we place our faith in Jesus Christ and His resurrection power. How can this power help us in our struggles? Well, this is where Charles Spurgeon wisely said this some 150 years ago. He said this, This very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunkard from his drunkenness, to raise the thief from his dishonesty, to raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness, to raise the Sadducee, from his unbelief. This power has the power to transform your life. And what is amazing is that this power is not just for you and me. Why do I say that? It is for the whole church, the body of Christ. When God has put all things under his feet, Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is body, the fullness of him who feels all and in all. This resurrected power unites us and our unity glorifies God. Unity is a central motif, a theme that Paul says throughout this whole letter and he values that so much. We don't value unity in Bethany because it's in our vision statement. All right? We value unity because God values unity. Because that unity glorifies God Himself. When you and I, despite our differences, our difficulties, our personality clashes, when we, have, we make choices that are against one another, and yet we can still sing Kumbaya, my Lord, where we can hold hands together and greet each other, civically at least, <laughs> on a Sunday morning and the rest of the six days. We know that it is because of what Jesus has brought on the cross for us through His blood, that unity that's purchased with His death and His resurrection. Remember that faint cry of hope that Mrs. Siap cried out just a few evenings ago. She whispered, darling, see you in heaven. I do not know what she had in mind. I didn't have an opportunity to talk to her thereafter, just to shake her hand. But I know that it's certainly not what this poet, Dylan Thomas, my, my mother's favourite poet, actually, she has an entire book, of his poems and all that. And he wrote this, and I, I felt that this is quite sad because at the end of your, your life, this is what this poet said, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. As Christians, we do not rage against the dying of the light. We rest in Christ, 
our light. Our struggles in life, and I know that there will be many, our struggles in life can only find rest in Jesus Christ, who has purchased us, won us over through His death and resurrection from the dead. Jesus is our confidence. Why? He's our confidence in our calling. He's our confidence in our inheritance. He's our confidence in our power because He is the source of all these things. May that thought hold us captive as we move forth into 2024 with fresh hope and fresh faith in Christ Jesus. Because if Jesus is all we've got, He is all we need. Amen.